Have you ever asked yourself how has there not ever been a single important pirate in the entire story of One Piece with an eye patch? Have you also ever wondered, could Oda be saving this pirate show for the most legendary pirate of all, Joy Boy? What if I told you that I figured out who this legendary pirate was, who Joy Boy was, and how Elbaf will be one of, if not the most important arc in the entire story of One Piece? Elbaf will reveal literally everything and I think I solved why. Now before we get into the video, please remember to smash that like button and even subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of our next insane uploads. And with all that being said, let's get straight into the theory. In 2007, Oda said that in the final scenes of One Piece, there's a pirate who appears with an eye patch. He can't wait to draw this character in the story, which shows that it's gonna most likely be someone of major importance. We've also seen many references in One Piece with some sort of eye scar. For example, Hedro, Shanks, Zoro, Rayleigh, Doflamingo's Jolly Roger, and so on. The biggest hint seemed to revolve around the Skypiea arc, which is definitely currently one of the most important arcs in all of One Piece. Volume 27 has one of Luffy's eyes closed for some reason. This is the same volume that Nami figures out the truth of the Jaya map. She shows us that Jaya and Upper Yard are the same thing and this is the first time we see that the left eye of Jaya is missing. Many people believe that the left eye has some significance to the mystery of the ancient kingdom and I myself can agree that it most likely does. This volume 27 of One Piece has many more references to Joy Boy that I'll be bringing up later in the video so just keep its importance in mind. So now that you understand the concept of the one eye being foreshadowed, you may be wondering, well what does this have to do with Joy Boy? Boy. This has to do with Joy Boy since Joy Boy seems to be based off of one of the most famous mythological legends of all time who had one eye and an eye patch. This legend was known as Odin. And not Odin from Wano, but Odin from Norse mythology. To start this crazy Odin theory, Odin's name means master of ecstasy. In case you don't know what ecstasy is, it's an overwhelming feeling of great happiness or joyful excitement. Isn't this basically Joy Boy? Isn't the name master of ecstasy or master of overwhelming joy basically the same as Joy Boy. The other definition for ecstasy is an emotional or religious frenzy or trans-like state. Doesn't this basically perfectly describe Gear 5? From the few instances we saw Gear 5, it seemed like Luffy was in sort of a trans-like state and frenzy. He looked like he was in a state of uncontrolled excitement. So as you can see, what Odin's name means and what Odin represents is basically just Joy Boy. If this wasn't enough for you to be convinced on Odin's connection to Joy Boy, then explain this. How come Odin was also known for wearing a broad hat, also known as a sun hat, or even more known as a straw hat. Yeah, that's right. Odin in Norse mythology was always known for wearing a straw hat or sun hat just like Joy Boy. Another thing he was known for was having a spear called Gun Gear. Maybe this spear Gun Gear is the same one that Nika has. Or at least Nika's spear is at least based off of it. Since we're dealing with Norse mythology here, if this spear is based off of Gun Gear, then that would mean Joy Boy probably received it from the Elbaf Giants. I feel like Elbaf would be the type of place to have weapon wielders since it is the home of a race of warriors. I also wonder what kind of weapons were the ancient kingdom capable of making since we now know that they had a civilization even more advanced than the one today. They definitely seemed to have technology that we could only imagine to see in the story one day, but did you know that in the real world, we have certain technologies that not even Oda could think of? That technology would be NordVPN. According to AV test, NordVPN is the fastest VPN in the market by a considerable margin, nearly twice as fast as its competition. This allows you to upload and download things at an efficient, and fast rate. It also gives your device extreme protection and safety and on top of that it allows you to unlock content that isn't available in your region. Arguably the best attribute about NordVPN is that you can use up to six devices with a single account. This includes both computers and smartphones so you wouldn't have to buy multiple accounts for multiple devices. You also wouldn't have to pay any extra for a family plan of up to six people. So is it good? Well I think so but you don't have to take it from me. In fact take it from security.org who ranked NordVPN as the fastest rating among all VPN in the world. As anime fans, you can use NordVPN to watch anime that might not be available in your region or country. I know there's at least one anime you can't watch simply because it won't stream in your region, and if you really want to watch that anime, then NordVPN will simply solve your problem in a legal and safe way. Check out the link in my description for a great deal on the best VPN there is. This is a limited time offer. 
So now, going back to the Joy Boy Odin theory, if Joy Boy is based off of Odin, then we could only assume that he has gun gear and an eye patch over an eye that was cut out. A possible foreshadow of him being the character with an eye patch could be the fact that we learn about Nika from Who's Who, who has the one eyed symbolism on his chest. There's another hint that Who's Who may give us about Joy Boy, but before that, I need to explain how Odin's name tells us exactly who Joy Boy was. So, in case you didn't know, Odin was known by many different names in Norse mythology. Different places gave him different names and different spellings. In a way, this is kind of like how Joy Boy is known by many different names such as Joy Boy, Nika, the Sun God, the Fire God, and more. The most popular name that scholars and archaeologists have found in connection to Odin is Odor. They believe that the god called Odor is just another version of Odin since their names mean these same things and also since there was a period of time where Odin was supposedly exiled by the gods and Odor also had an absence for a period of time which corresponds to the same one as Odin. So now that you understand the theory that Odin and Odor are the same god, I want to show you a few more meanings behind their names. Some other meanings the word Odor has is soul and song. I feel like this could be tied in with Joy Boy since we know that he has the drums of liberation and whenever he appears he basically plays a song with his heartbeat. We also know how important souls are in One Piece and I feel like souls or wills will be a major factor when we learn the truth of the whole world. So now that I've explained all this, you may be wondering, yeah. I get it, Odin and Joy Boy resemble each other, but what's the purpose of Odor? Like what does Odor even have to do with anything? Well the reason for me having to explain the whole thing with Odor is because of this. Okay, you're probably pretty confused right now, but just give me a second and let me explain how it's all tied. So where the spelling in Japanese has the same exact kanji or same exact lettering as the Norse god Odor and the One Piece wiki even states that Orz's name is even based off of this name. So could Orz potentially be the one that is based off of Odor? Odin. Could Ors have been the one-eyed pirate who wore a sun hat or straw hat and an eye patch? Could he have been the one who owned gun gear? Could he have been Joy Boy? Well, wouldn't it just make sense that he was Joy Boy since we see his introduction scene perfectly parallel the giant straw hat scene. Eam walks into a giant freezer just like how Moria walks into a giant freezer with a similar looking lock. Eam carries Luffy's wanted poster while Moria carries Luffy's shadow. On top of all of this, when we see Ors for the very first time, the shape of Luffy's shadow is literally literally the shape of Nika. Mind blowing, am I right? Now before I get into any more reasons why Orz is Joy Boy, I need to tell the newcomers that I'm not actually talking about the Orz and Thriller Bark, but instead I'm talking about Orz the First. You see, Orz Jr. proves to us that he is actually Orz the Third, which makes me believe that Orz and Thriller Bark is actually Orz the Second. Orz the First would be the father of Orz the Second and he most likely lived in the Void Century. This would explain why there's a missing Orz to the supposed three family members. So now that you understand that, let me tell you some more hints that Oda's given us that Ors is Joy Boy. Another hint would be that Mori puts Luffy's shadow into Ors showing that the both of them are connected in some way. On top of this, we see even more times that Luffy's shadow looks almost exactly like the Nika silhouette right as Moria is about to put him into Ors. I mean, if you rewatch or reread that stretch and thriller bark where Ors is first introduced, you'll see how there's so many instances of Nika and Joy Boy being foreshadowed to the point where it's like, come on now? A hint from the latest chapter, 1060 66 could be that Luffy calls the Ors robot Robo King. Could this be foreshadowing that Ors was once a king? Or more specifically, the original King of the Pirates? This could possibly be a little bit of a stretch, but you never know with Oda. Now for the next hint, I want to go back to the important volume 27 that I brought up before. So in the same volume that Luffy has an eye closed and then we see Jaya for the first time, we also see this. Yes, that's right. It's a Shandian mask that looks exactly like Ors. Another thing we see in Upper Yard is this. Is a bunch of statues that resemble Orz's face. You know it's meant to be Orz since its teeth and face structure are exactly the same. So is it really a coincidence that the people who worship the sun god wear Orz masks and have Orz statues? Well, I don't think so. In this same volume, we also see the party in Skypea where Luffy looks exactly like the Nika shadow. In case you didn't know, Oda said that this is one of his favorite panels in all of One Piece and we now know why. I think if you decode what's in this volume, you'll come to the conclusion that it might be the most important volume to solving who Joy Boy was and to the Ancient Kingdom. Another hint with Ors being Joy Boy is that if you look back at Wano, you'll also notice that Oda's
specifically chose to have Luffy become Joy Boy while on Onigashima and fighting Kaido. Yet again, Joy Boy is fully connected with Oars or the Oni Rays. I've also said in previous videos that I believe there's a chance that Onigashima's head could have belonged to Oars the First, whom I believe to be Joy Boy. Now, I know this seems like a stretch because the size of the skull would quite literally equate to him being the biggest being in the verse, but trust me, I have a good reason that fixes this plot hole. So, in case you forgot, the gum gum is actually the human human fruit model Nika, and if it's the human human zone fruit, then wouldn't that basically mean that Ors would be able to shrink down into a human form? In the same way that Chopper has a human form? We also see in Wano that a wolf who ate another human human fruit also becomes a human. With knowing this, we should just assume that Ors could have shrunk down to a human size simply by using the powers of the fruit. On top of this, who knows how many true forms he had since we also see that both Luffy and Chopper, whom have human human fruits, can have more than three forms. For example, Luffy has up to five gears and Chopper has many rumble ball forms. Maybe Ors had seven gears, or maybe eight, nine, four, and so on. I mean, the possibilities should be endless with the fruit of imagination. So now, for the last piece of Ors being Joy Boy that I'll explain in this video has to do with who's who again. Just like the one-eyed symbolism, he's also an Oni, or at least has Oni horns, which may hint at the Joy Boy from the Void Century being an Oni. Remember that he was the one who told us about Nika in the first place. So now that I've explained all that, do you believe Ors the First was Joy Boy? If you do, make sure you subscribe to the channel because I plan to release a huge 1-2 to two hour long Ors' Joy Boy theory sometime at the end of this year or beginning of next year. I can't wait to drop it, but it just takes so much time to create. And if you liked anything about this theory, then also send it to all of your One Piece friends that either denied the theory or haven't heard it yet. But anyways, now let me explain what this all has to do with Elbaf and how Elbaf is the key to everything. So it is my belief that Ors was very close friends with the Elbaf Giants, and the reason I believe this is because it seems that Oda has foreshadowed it continuously throughout all of One Piece. I mean, almost every time we've seen the Elbaf Giants, there's some sort of symbolism with Joy Boy or Ors. And to start off, their Jolly Rogers are literally just Ors. Now yeah, I get it, Vikings wear horned helmets, which is why the Vikings in Elbaf also wear horned helmets and even make their Jolly Rogers have a horned helmet skull. Well, this is actually not true. Did you know that Vikings actually never wore horned helmets and it's one of the biggest lies that pop culture has taught us? Knowing Oda, I feel like he would know this fact since he obviously researches very heavily on all of his history and his references for One Piece. I feel like he would make it where the Vikings from the pre-Void Century didn't wear horned helmets but once they met Joy Boy, they started wearing it. The reason for it could be to show that they are friends with Oars and were on his side during the Void Century War. Another reason could also be to prove that they are connected with the Ancient Kingdom just like the Shandians. Them wearing horn helmets could be a tradition passed down from the Void Century, just like how the Shandians still wear the Oars masks. And even the people of Wano seem to have traditions of resembling Onis when we see that they wear Oni masks during the Fire Festival. I mean, why would they wear masks of the exact people that were destroying their home and taking away their food? Like, the only reasonable answer would be because it's a tradition passed down from the ancient times. Another thing that connects the Elbaf Giants with the Ancient Kingdom is the sun signs that they have on their boats. As you can clearly see, one of the signs has the exact same sun logo as the Shandians and Kazuki clan. It's a circle with eight little circles around it, just like the Shandian sign of God and the Kazuki crest. This proves that they're all connected to the ancient kingdom and that one day, they'll all come back together as Luffy, the current sun god, brings them back. Also notice how another sign we see on this boat is a sun with eight rays around, which is very similar to a sun logo on the moon, which also has eight rays. This sign also proves that it's connected to the ancient kingdom. Now, the last bit of foreshadowing that Elbaf has direct ties to the sun god is when we see that they have an annual festival for the winter solstice. Holidays or festivals celebrating the winter solstice were for honoring the sun's rebirth. We even see that the Elbaf giants in One Piece celebrated for this reason when Mother Carmel says that the winter solstice is a festival for the death and rebirth of the sun. She then says, the harder the fast is, the deeper our gratitude is to the sun. This shows that they still celebrate holidays and events for the sun, just like how the Shandians have ceremonies for the Sun God. And I believe that by the end of One Piece, we will see the true meaning behind the Sun God and the Ancient Kingdom and honestly, I may have to make a whole video on my thoughts about that. Let me know in the comments what you think about the Sun God symbolism in One Piece. So the last piece of foreshadowing that Oars and the Elbaf were very close has to do with Dory. In chapter 116, Luffy meets the giant Dory. When they meet, they get along very well and then notice how Vivi says that the two of them are like old friends. I find this quote to be very interesting 
interesting because what if Oda was trying to give us a hint that Joy Boy or Luffy naturally gets along with the Elbaf Giants because the original Joy Boy was once friends with them. And if Joy Boy is friends with the Elbaf Giants, then that would mean that in a way they kind of are like old friends. Now on the next page, we see Dory explaining the Elbaf code and he states that whenever there's an argument between two Elbafs, the God of Elbaf decides the matter. He's the one who lets the one in the right live. And this is why he and Bragi have been going at it for like a hundred years. And notice how after Bragi tells him this, Phoebe starts barking that fighting for a hundred years over something is stupid. And then she says, what could this argument even be over? Luffy immediately shuts her up and says that it doesn't matter. He basically tells us that he agrees with the 100 year battle and thinks it's the right thing to do. Since he agrees with Dory, I believe this foreshadows that Luffy is somewhat agreeing with the God of Elbaf. And what if the God of Elbaf was Oars and Luffy agreeing with the Elbaf code could symbolize that he's the same as the god of Elbaf since he is also Joy Boy. I mean, it would only make sense that the god of Elbaf is the sun god since we know for a fact that they have holidays for the sun. I believe this not only foreshadows the fact that Luffy is the god of Elbaf, but I also think it might foreshadow the Void Century. Dory and Luffy claim that fighting for a hundred years isn't an insane matter and that they wouldn't lose their passion for battle. Fighting for 100 years is only something that a giant could do, which means that Joy Boy would have had to most likely been a giant. All the colossal creatures of One Piece seem to live for hundreds of years. For example, the Elbaf living up to 300, the Sea Kings living for at least 800 to 900 years, and lastly Zunisha living for at least 800 to 900 years as well. Now, knowing this, it would only make sense that Joy Boy was a being of colossal size, and I mean, there's no way he was even human or a Lunarian or a Skypean, because if he was, then how would he have existed in the Void Century War for a whole century? I mean, it wouldn't make sense. Plus, I I find it even more convincing that he was an ancient Oni giant and not an Elbaf giant since it seems that the world government wiped out the giant Oni race and since the only one we've seen actually alive in the current timeline is Ors Jr. Every time we've seen something about the ancient kingdom, there's some sort of reference to the ancient giants, but for some reason, none of them exist anymore. The world government probably wiped all of them out due to them being the most powerful opponents they ever had to face. And I mean, just imagine Ors Jr. with the Nika fruit or even with something like Sabo's fruit. Like, could you just imagine how powerful he could be with that? And even, forget fruits, imagine Little Ors Jr. with Congress hockey or mastering all three types of hockey. Like, he'd easily be the strongest in the verse with any of these abilities and feats. Now, the next thing I want to connect with Elbaf and Joy Boy has to do with Saul. Saul will guide the Elbaf back to their roots, which is the ancient kingdom. And from the most recent chapters, we learn that Saul survived and also that he's currently carrying on the will of Ohara. And Saul said, that Ohara gave their lives to save this asset of humanity, we can't let it be erased from history when talking about the books. Since he recovered them with other Elbaf giants, who knows just how much they learned. I mean, they definitely know what the ancient kingdom was since we see that Vegapunk was also able to learn about it, but they may have even learned about such myths like Joy Boy. Or who knows, maybe Joy Boy is a tradition passed down in their culture in the same way that he's passed down in the Fishmen and Shandians culture. If this is true, then they could possibly figure out a lot more about Joy Boy and the Void Century since they're conscious of the fact that these legendary tales might actually be real stories and not just some made up stories for children. The Elbaf giants that Saul has taught are in some way like a revolutionary army since they're both fighting for Ohara and going against the Celestial Dragons. If anyone knows the world government better than Dragon, it would be Saul since he was a high ranked vice admiral and the two of them will probably end up becoming friends or alliances. I mean, I don't really see why this wouldn't happen since they have the same ambitions and similar justices, and who knows, Aokiji may even be in the mix as either a secret revolutionary or member of S.W.O.R.D., but I already explained all of my thoughts on this in another video, so go check it out after this one if you're interested. I've also explained my theory on the Alabasta and Revolutionary Army Alliance in an even other video, and if you're interested in all the possibilities for the Final Saga War, then I'd recommend checking out that video as well to see how it may play out. But anyways, it's probably destiny for Luffy to go to Elbaf last, or right before Laugh Tail, since he may have had to go after becoming Joy Boy. And now that he's unlocked Gear 5, we may see armies being built at Elbaf. And since the island is literally in an area of the world called 
Warland. This will probably be the island where the final war starts and possibly even where a part of the final war takes place. It'll probably be a base for the armies of both the revolutionaries and straw hats and basically anyone who's fighting for the will of the ancient kingdom. So we might see the straw hat fleet gathering there as well as other kingdoms that dragon has gathered. I honestly can't even imagine how hyped the chapters are going to be when we finally see Elbaf, its connection to the ancient kingdom and Saul again after 25 years.